We are out in the subpolar gyre of the central Iceland basin, almost 500 nautical miles from the Icelandic coast. Here in the North Atlantic Ocean on the Royal Research Ship James Cook, we are 23 scientists, 8 technicians and 22 crew. Hailing from over 8 organisations and calling over 12 countries home, we're diverse in spirit but singular in our aim, to understand the biological influence on future ocean storage of carbon. I'm Ariane Wen, a PhD student and science communicator from the University of Oxford, and I had the pleasure of sailing on JC269 in both capacities. But what are we really doing out here? Over the span of a given 24 hours, we have six regular deployments, all helping to piece together a part of the puzzle of just how the biological life in our oceans works together and interacts with non-biological factors to influence how the ocean stores carbon. First up, with the break of the new day, we have the bongo nets so-called because they resemble, well, bongos. The spirited zooplankton team, led by Professor Dan Mayer of the University of Exeter, seemingly never sleeps, relentlessly deploying these nets five times every midnight and midday. There's a sextillion, an estimated sextillion copepods in the global ocean. Yeah. So that's a one with 21 zeros at the end of it. And that's two orders of magnitudes more than all of the insects on land. One of, the, one of the key roles across all the projects is understanding how much these animals are actually consuming in terms of carbon, where does that carbon go, and how do, does the relationship between zooplankton and phytoplankton change as uh, different parts of the year, and how that influences the flux of carbon into the deep ocean. As dawn breaks, if you take a walk out the back deck, you'll see Team Snowcatcher readying their four 100-litre samplers to dive hundreds of metres below the ocean's surface. Well, the aspect of it that I'm looking at uh, focuses on the particles in the water and how they sink and work out uh, the carbon content of the particles so that we can figure out how much carbon ends up sinking to the seafloor. The new day means it's time for our biggest deployment, the CTD device. The CTD is the backbone of water sampling on the ship, bringing back 24 Neskin bottles full of water from 12 depths spanning kilometres below the ocean's surface. Almost every scientist on board will sample from our CTDs, analysing everything from abiotic factors, particulate organic and inorganic carbon, nutrients like phosphate and silicate, the dissolved oxygen concentration of the water, looking at chlorophyll and fluorescence, bringing home samples for liquid chromatography, looking at the plankton communities by FlowCam, sequencing metagenomes and transcriptomes, and much, much more. But what's all this for? Led by principal scientist Mark Moore of the University of Southampton, we are the second of two biocarbon expeditions, the first led by Stephanie Henson on the RRS discovery earlier this year. And these two expeditions were designed to target key parts of the seasonal cycle, the spring bloom and the transition into winter. So the, the way that biology ultimately influences the storage of carbon in the ocean is organisms called phytoplankton. So they're photosynthetic organisms. So the first bit of the carbon storage in the ocean is those organisms use dissolved carbon dioxide to make energy from sunlight, ultimately to make new copies of themselves. And that uh, generates a pool of what we call organic carbon in the ocean. And that material that gets into the deeper ocean is then a source of carbon into the deeper ocean and that acts to store carbon in, in the deep ocean. One of the really unique things about biocarbon is the integration of autonomy with ship-based sampling. We have two main classes of autonomy, our floats and gliders, as well as the auto-submission, aka Boaty McVoteface, earlier this year. Expedition JC269 was punctuated with float and glider deployments and recoveries. Essentially what they do is they go up and down in the, in the water column to collect uh, various oceanographic data, it depends on what the scientists want. On this particular mission, they wanted um, fluorescence, uh, optics, so far sensor as well, uh, oxygen, and then general CT uh, data. How they operate simply is using this portion of the front here, which is a buoyancy drive, and it will increase and decrease its internal density so it can sink and climb in the ocean. And these autonomous vehicles, along with remote sensing data, allow us to create the most accurate models for carbon fixation and the contribution of biological life to the carbon cycle. Phytoplankton absorb blue light. They change the color of the ocean. So when there's more phytoplankton, more green light is reflected, so the oceans are greener. That's what these um, satellite images show, is kind of the greenness of the ocean. And part of our task is to use these maps of 
ocean color to estimate the amount of carbon that's being fixed. However, biology doesn't always work in our favour for carbon fixation and sequestration. Some biological processes actually work to release carbon back into the atmosphere. The idea around chalky is that the coprophores are the uh, criminals, the anti-heroes effectively, their calcification releases CO2. And so it weakens the ability of the ocean to absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. So they work in reverse to most of the other processes we look at. And so within chalky, we're really trying to understand their ecology and their, their kind of interactions with different organisms and how it influences CO2 fluxes. There's also a uh, missing element that our observations of the CO2 going into the ocean don't match with the models. Effectively, the models underestimate it uh, by up to a third. Chalky is partly motivated by trying to recognise the importance of biology in that missing third. Expedition JC269 was part of the NERC-funded Biocarbon Programme, or the Biological Influence on Future Ocean Storage of Carbon. The ocean stores huge amounts of carbon dioxide that would otherwise be in our atmosphere, further warming our planet. And marine organisms play a critical role in this. But new research suggests climate models do not fully account for their impact. This program works to provide new understanding of the role of marine life that's needed to make robust predictions of future ocean carbon storage. To find out more about this program and its fieldwork expeditions, visit bio-carbon.ac.uk.